Hi everyone. Uh, today we are together with Matt Ellington. Matt is Microsoft MEP and one of the very well-known bloggers in Power BI community. Uh, today's subject is M language and uh, he's going to talk about learning M through the user interface in Power Query. Uh, Matt, uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. Welcome. Great, uh, thank you. To go. Great to be here. Thank you so very much. Glad you with us. Yeah, great. And uh, also to Mustafa, thank you very much for the opportunity. I've just turned my uh, webcam off. I'm not sure that my face will add much value, and the extra bandwidth I think for my presentation might be um, might be well appreciated. So, uh, but yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to teleport around the world into. <laughs> Turkey and maybe other surrounding places. I was just saying to Halil that I've been to um, I've been to Istanbul and I would love to come back and spend some serious time in Turkey in the future. So looking forward to hopefully doing that. So let me briefly introduce myself. So yes, my name is Matt Allington. Um, my background, I worked at Coca-Cola for 25 years. And in fact, that was how I came to get to Istanbul for a few hours going back a few years ago now. And I worked in sales and I also worked in process, uh, process management, and I spent 10 years working in IT. So I had a really good opportunity of understanding how businesses run from a business perspective, but also how IT departments support businesses that run. And um, I'm a pretty opinionated person, so I, when I was a business person, I had a pretty strong view of how IT should be run. And when I went into IT, I realized that it wasn't quite as easy as I thought it uh, it should be. But uh, I spent uh, I spent the last six years working in Power BI, and this is what we're going to be talking about today. And um, when I first started um, six years ago, 2014. Power Pivot for Excel was the product. That was the big new thing. And then Power Query was just coming out and then Power BI came out a few years later. And you know, the reason you're all here, I'm sure, is because you see something in these products that I also see and and continue to be impressed by. Um, so yeah, I do training, consulting, training all around the world, consulting all around the world. And um, I've got a blog, which you may know of. And also um, I've written a couple of books. There's actually only one book, this one here called Learn to Write DAX, but I've updated it. It's been updated three times, as you can see there. And I'm currently working on my fourth version. OK, so enough about me. Let's get into the topic. And this topic is learning M from the UI. And it's sort of an opportunity for me to demonstrate the way I go about solving problems, because I'm a bit of a hacker under the hood. Um, I learned Excel VBA by turning on the VBA macro recorder and doing something and then turning off the macro recorder and then jumping into the code and having a look at what was going on. And I literally taught myself to write VBA that way, as I'm sure many other people have done as well. So the objective of this session is to introduce the topic of the M language and to show you how you can use the user interface to help learn and just discover some of the capability of the M language and do some things that are a little bit more powerful than you could if you were just using the user interface inside Power Query. And I'm in by no means being critical of the user interface of Power Query because it's fantastic. You can do so many things without doing any programming at all, but I like to have a look at what's going under the hood, and I think you can be a better, stronger Power Query user if you turn on the user interface and start having a look at the code. So there will be a quick intro and overview, but most of the session is going to be demos, and we do have um, a live Q&A open, so feel free to put any questions that you have into the live q and A, I I think we're basically going to try and save the questions towards the end. Um, I should have about 45 minutes of content, but it's a while since I've done this. So we'll, we'll just see how we go and I'll be happy to take any questions on anything uh, towards the end time permitting. So the three demos I'm going to show you. First of all, I'm going to show you how to extract 
values from a specific cell in a spreadsheet so that you can use that to build out a table for analysis purposes. And in doing so, once again, I'm going to show you how to use the UI to actually understand and learn the M language. Then we'll have a look at um, a way that you can reference relative columns and row names. So the naming conventions, so I've got another um, demo. And then finally, I'm going to show you something a little bit different where I'm going to go through the process of building a calendar table as you might use in Power BI for reporting purposes, but a calendar table completely from scratch, um, just basically generating the data from within Power Query rather than loading data from another source, which is the typical way that you would use Power BI or Power Query in this case. All right, I like to always start off with this slide. Um, if you've seen any of my presentations before, you may have seen this slide. And, and indeed, um, no doubt some of you have some experience with the M language and Power Query at least. So, you know, some of this stuff you may already know, but often you'll pick up little pieces just by listening to somebody different and, and having a different explanation of the topics. So I like to think of self-service BI as being a four stage process. And so, and the reason I think it's important to talk about this is that self-service BI is a citizen development process. So we're not talking about necessarily IT professionals who go to university for three or four years and get a um, an IT degree, they, they're experts in data modeling, and then they go ahead and, and deploy a project. In many cases, we're talking about citizen developers business people who have been perhaps Excel experts in the past and now they're starting to build self-service business intelligence projects. And so I think it's good to have a framework. And so the first thing that happens with every BI project is the data acquisition. So this is the build stage, not the planning stage. So data acquisition, you have to grab the data from wherever it lives, whatever source, and load it into the Power BI database. So that's step one data acquisition, and the tool that we use for that is, of course, Power Query. The second phase, once the data is loaded into the database, this is, I think, the most important phase called data modeling. And this is where we have to prepare the raw data so that we can extract the insights from the raw data. If you don't get this stage right, everything becomes complicated and hard and difficult. So understanding data modeling is really important. And this is Power Pivot or Analysis Services, and the language we use for that is DAX. And then we do data visualization and data sharing. And in a way, these last two things, even though they're the, that's where the rubber hits the road, that's where the value is extracted, it's the two steps prior to that, that where all the work is done. If you don't get the foundation work done, you can't you can't build the visuals and do the sharing. And so I think the first two steps sort of make up 80% orders of magnitude of the amount of work that needs to be done. And so this session um, today is clearly in this Power Query data acquisition phase. It's really got nothing to do with these other phases. Okay, so that's it for the uh, quick intro. So let's get started. And I'm gonna show you this demo where we extract values from a specific cell in Excel, and then we're going to use that to help build out a table. Now, to start off with, this is the data that I'm going to use. So just let me show you. I've got three files here. They're Excel files, and I'm going to use File Combine to load these up in a moment. And I'll just show you one of these files. So let me open that up. And they're all of a similar shape and structure. And this is demo data. So demo data is deliberately simplistic, but realistic. So there's no point in me showing you demo data that just you click a button and everything works if the demo data doesn't represent what typically happens in the real world. And so in this demo data, notice that I've got a row at the top, which is a um, some sort of stamp coming from some system. So imagine this was an extract from SAP. Um, this extract was completed on the 15th of June and it's for sales on the date, 14th of June, and here's the product codes and the product quantity. And every sheet that I'm going to combine here follows this basic structure. And so we can use the file combine process. The challenge is that we need to get this date out of this cell and into 
columns in our table so that we can use it for reporting purposes. And that's basically the exercise that I'm going to step through now. Now I'm going to copy the path here because I find it much easier to browse to a folder by copying a path in Windows Explorer. So find the folder in Windows Explorer and then Control C to copy it. And then I use that rather than the Power Query Browse button, which I don't find overly um, easy to use. OK, so I've got a blank um, Power BI desktop file here. And so I'm going to come up and I'm going to say get data. I'm not going to select from Excel because if I did that, I would be selecting from a single workbook. In this case, I need to come down to get data more and I need to find the folder function, which here it is here. And this allows me to point to a folder and load every single file that is stored in that folder from time to time. So I'm going to select the folder. As I said, if I click browse here, notice how it takes me back to the starting process. Very difficult, um, it needs to be fixed. But instead, I'm just going to paste my path in here and now I'll click OK. And here are the three files that exist in that folder. Now, I'm sure many of you know if I click transform data, it will load up Power Query with these three files in it. If I click load, it will, well, actually, I'm not sure what it will do in this case, but I'm going to click um, combine and transform data. So this is the opportunity for me to um, have a look at the automatic combined process and then potentially manipulate that before it gets loaded. If I selected this one, I wouldn't have any opportunity before it was loaded. And in this case, I happen to know that it's going to cause a problem. All right, so this wizard pops up. This is the combine files wizard. And it's actually quite simple as long as you understand what's going on. So the way Power BI works here, just let me see if I've got my, my drawing tool here. So the way uh, Power Query works here is it says, teach me how to process a file. You teach me how to process a single file. And once I know how to process that single file, I'll repeat that process as many times as I need to in order to load all the data. So that's basically what this wizard does. And so this first option here is saying, which file should I load? And the default is the first file. And I recommend that you leave it at the default. You could change it and specify one of these named files. The problem with doing this is that if you move that file or rename the file, then the entire query will break. Whereas if you take the first file, it will continue to work regardless of what's happening. And so I'm saying, give me the first file. And now I'm saying, go to sheet one. And here is the data that I'm going to load. Now, or Already you can see there's a problem here because somehow the column has been, um, the, the, the first row in the table has been promoted to the column. And now the first column is called job completed on the 15th of June, which is not correct. I need the columns to be this one here. But this is the way Power Query automatically is processing this single file. So I'll click OK and uh, now there's still a little bug here. I thought they'd fix that, but notice that I've got this yellow sign at the top here and no sign of Power Query. Sometimes, particularly when you're doing file combine, the Power Query window gets hidden behind the Power BI window and it's just a matter of bringing it to the front. And so here we go. Now there's a lot going on here and I understand that this is a little bit confusing. I do have a blog article on this and the links to the blog article are in my slides, which I'll make available to Hello um, after the call and um, he can distribute them. And so the two things that you need to know about here are these two queries here, this one and this one. These are the only two that you really need to worry about. All the rest of this stuff is covered in my blog article and it's a little bit noisy, but you need to know this one here, which is the sample file. So this one says, teach me how to deal with a single file. And then once you've done that, this one combines all of the files using the learning that we taught Power Query over here. So, so that's basically the way it works. And so if you have a problem with your load, I recommend that you start up here. Try and fix the sample file first. Once you've got that right, then come back and combine all of the files together. Now, if you have a look here, I'm on this last query. So this is the file combined. So notice here that this one is 
this is file one, and then this is file two, and then file three, and so on. But notice we're getting nulls here, and we're getting product codes here. So there's something wrong with this particular query, and it's directly related to this header column here, because there's only one file that has a column called job completed on the 15th of June, and that's the file, file one, which was for sales on the 16th of June. So that's the problem. So in order to fix this, I'm going to come back to the sample file and see whether we can work out what's going on. Now, over here on the right, I'm sure you know are uh, the uh, applied steps. So the way this query currently works is that we went to the source and then we navigated to the first sheet and then we promoted the first row as headers. And it's this step that's actually incorrect. And so I'm going to, and so you notice here that the 15th of June is the column. When I delete this step, watch what happens over here to this query. So I delete this step. Now this query is broken because this query is looking for a table or, or a, uh, another query that has a column that's called job completed on the 15th of June 2020, and that column no longer exists, and that's why this query has broken. So we're going to have to come back and fix this later on, but for now, um, we're pretty good. Now, notice at the top that I have the formula bar turned on. I highly recommend that you turn on the formula bar. If you don't do this, you can't learn the M language from the UI. It would be like using my VBA macro recorder and then never looking at the code underneath. And so this is the line of code that applies to this particular step. So I'm going to do a couple of things. I don't need this first row, so I'm going to come up here and just say remove top rows. I'll specify the first row. And now I've got the data that I need because in this cell here is the date of the sales. And then these two columns here are the headers that I ultimately need. All right, so what to do next? So what I need to do now, um, so make sure that you come up here and turn this on. I don't think I showed you where. So come up to view and turn on the formula bar here. You really uh, should have that turned on at all times. All right, so let's go ahead and what I'd like to do is I'm, I need to grab this date. And if I click on this date, down the bottom here, you can see that the date in this cell is actually being displayed here. So it's the 14th of the 6th. Um, I'm assuming you're using international date format, so that's 14th of June. And so sometimes there's these undocumented um, UI tips, so I can right click on this cell and select drill down. And what will happen then is that value that appeared down the bottom is now the value that the query is returning. So if I hit file, close and apply now, this, this is the only number that would get returned. In this case, it's a date. But more importantly, I want you to um, have a look at the way these additional steps are working. Now, the way Power uh, Query typically works is that every new step refers to a previous step. Now, at the moment, this remove top row step, notice that this hash equal sign, or sorry, this hash inside quotes, that exact text here, remove top rows, is exactly the text that appears over here. And this is the way that Power Query refers to the steps. They all, it always puts the hash followed by quotes and then the name of the step. Now, in fact, the reason it uses this hash is to differentiate between a text string and a step. And if I just renamed this step, which I do recommend on certainly on important steps, if I remove those spaces, notice how this now no longer has the hash quotes and now it just says remove top step, a uh, top rows um, zero column two. So I just want to explain to you, and this is part of learning M from the UI, what this syntax is doing. So this first piece here is the step. So it says go to the previous step. This next bit here in the curly braces is the row reference. And this bit here is the column reference. So let's go back and have a look at the table. So here's the table. And notice that the cell I clicked on is the first row and the column is called column two. And so when I drilled down on this step, 
what got generated is it says go to the previous table, which is this one here, and it says give me the, the first row and the column, name column two, the intersection of the first row and the column called column two. And once again, this is what, what I really want to impress on you is that you can learn stuff by doing this. So if I change that to column one, it gives me what's in column one. And if I now notice also that this curly braces, the row reference is a zero based number format. So zero is the first row, one is the second row, two is the third row and so on. But I can now start to write some M code and say, give me the third row, column one, and that's product. So if I come back here, the third row, column one is product. And so this is just some very simple syntax, which I didn't write. All I did was drill down on the cell and Power Query wrote the code for me. And so now I know a little bit of M code. I know how to refer to any cell in any table by referring to the table name, followed by the intersection of the row number and the, the name of the column. All right, so now I've got a problem because my query now only returns a date. What I really want is this table here. And so what I need to do now is I need to go back and fetch the table from earlier on. And so this is another learning for Power Query, and that is that your steps do not have to go in logical order. So I'm going to add a new step here, and by default, it just grabs the previous step, which is column two. But there is nothing saying that you have to always grab the previous step. I can grab any step from in this query. And so instead of grabbing the previous step, which is column two, I'm going to go back and grab the remove top rows step. And so now I had remove top rows. This here tells me the date. And now this here gives me the top rows again. And so I'm going to rename this step and I'm going to call this sales date. And I'm going to rename this step. And I like to give this a name just so I know what I did. So I'm going to call it bring back data. Okay, so now it's clear to me what's happening over here. All right, so now I've got these. Now I'm going to tidy up this table. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to remove the top rows. I'll get rid of the first two rows. And then I'm going to promote the first row as header. And so now my table looks good. And the last thing to do is to come and grab this sales date and make it appear in a new column. And so to do that, I'm going to add a column, a custom column, and this will be my sales date. And I'm allowed to refer to any step in my query that returns a single value. So this step here returned a single value, which was the date. And so I can say, give me the sales date. Now remember this, if you don't know, this is a case sensitive language, so you have to do it case sensitive. And there's my sales date there appearing all the way down the column. And so now just with a little bit of hacking, looking at the M code using the UI, I've got a nicely structured table for one single file that's in my folder. So now I need to come back and deal with this other issue where I need to combine all the files together. And to do that, I'm going to now whenever this happens and believe me, it will happen to you. You'll get error messages. I normally start at the bottom and the first thing I always do change type is a likely candidate for errors. So these can be very dangerous, but I just simply go to the previous step and see whether it was working at the previous step. And if not, you might want to do some sort of binary search. Basically just go up and down the list until you find the applied step that triggered the problem. And in this case, it was this last one. I don't need it. I'm just going to delete it. And so now my query is working again. And I've got this nice looking query. I might just tidy it up. I'm going to remove the source name. I'm going to multi-select, control click, and go to transform detect data type. Transform detect data type recreates that change type step. And that's pretty good. You should always change your, um, your your table names here. So this is going to be my sales. It's good practice to do that. And then file, close and apply. I'll just quickly throw a quick visual onto the canvas. It'll only take a second to process those three files just to show you that they're all processing. 
So I'm going to bring the sales dates into a matrix, turn it into a date, product code, quantity, no DAX today. And so there's my combined one table with the three files combined. Um, I'm sure many of you done this, but um, but the real beauty of this is that at some point in time, another file is going to come along. So if I drop that fourth file into this folder, now I've got four files and if you've done it correctly, all you have to do is hit that refresh button and the file will automatically update and um, and pretty much it's uh, maintenance free from then on. So let me um, jump back to my slide. So that was the first demo. So just in summary, if you want to learn M, you should definitely turn on the formula bar. Get into the habit of looking at the code that's generated by the steps and try and understand how it goes. The way the language works is that it's a functional language. And so Excel is a functional language. DAX is a functional language. So a function is just, it's like a black box. It takes, takes a number of inputs, which we call parameters, and then it gives you an output. And so the way the, the functional language in M works is it takes a step name, which is typically a table, and then it does something to that, to that table to give you a new version of the table. Well, I also showed you that you can right click on any cell to drill down on a value. When you do so, you'll get the step name, row number, column name syntax, and that's something that's pretty easy to remember. If you can't remember it, use the UI to drill down again, and then you'll it'll prompt you on how it works. And the other thing we learned is that you don't have to have your um, steps in a particular order. You can jump all over in Power Query and, and it will continue to work. All right, so um, let me move on to the second demo. And this one is called, uh, this is a relative column and row name uh, demo. So I'm gonna continue on using that technique that I just showed you. But this time I'm going to um, show you another couple of techniques. So let me show you the data first. So I'm going to do a, a slightly different type of combine this time. So I've got this consolidate worksheets Excel workbook. And what I want to do in this case is I want to load all the sheets and combine the sheets into Power, um, Power BI. I'm going to use Power Query. So notice I've got one sheet here per month, so January through to May. Also notice I have a couple of blank sheets that I don't want to load. And I don't have any other date information inside this um, this sheet and as you could perhaps imagine even though I've got five months worth of sales here um, presumably in June July August this sheet is going to get bigger so this this is one of those sheets that grows over time right with a new sheet being added month on month on month and this is part of the exercise that I'm going to show you all right so let me get a second um, workbook I'll just try and find a blank one here so this time I am going to go get data from Excel because this time I am connecting to a single workbook. Here it is, consolidate worksheets. And this is the standard connection navigator. And what I'm really supposed to do now is, cl is click on the sheets that I want. But if I do this, it's going to create five queries. And what's worse, I'm going to hard code five queries so then next month in June, when I get another sheet, the hard coding is not going to cater for that. And there's no apparent way of doing anything else here, except there's a hidden menu up here. So if you come up to the Consolidate Worksheets and right click, there's a hidden menu that allows you to transform the data as is without having to select one of the sheets. So if you click Transform Data from there, what Power Query will do was it will present you with a list, a table if you like, containing all of the sheets in the in the workbook. But at this stage, they haven't been combined. So I'm going to uh, do a couple of things here. I'm going to get rid of, I'll just keep the first two columns here. I don't need the others, so I'm going to remove other columns. And I also want to get rid of these two sheets. Um, now I could just come up here and deselect sheet one and sheet two, and that would work. 
But in in the bid to be a little bit more um, future proof, what I might do is I'm going to come text filters does not begin with sheet. And so what this does is it gives me a more generic bit of code so that if at some point in time someone puts another sheet in called sheet three, sheet four, they will also be removed without me having to intervene again. Now, once again, notice the UI. So the way this is working is the filtered rows step um, created a function. The function is called table.selectRows. The way this function works is it takes a table. In this case, the table is the one that existed previously. So whatever the table was at the previous step. And then it's basically saying for each row, um, keep the um, keep the rows that doesn't have sheet as the starting text. That's basically what that says. But you can work this out just by by looking at the way that the function is written. You don't have to be an expert. Um, you can certainly learn how it works. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand. So this is the expand button here. So this is similar to file combine if you like. And I'll just click uh, click expand. And now I've got all of my um, data that's been combined. And notice that the first row here is actually my header row. So I'm going to use the first row as header. And when I do that, at this point, it sort of all looks pretty good, but I'm going to trigger an error. If I click on this drop down arrow for the product key, notice it says list may be incomplete. And when I click on load more, I get this error. Data format error. And if I hover, it might give me the full error. So let's go load more, hover. We couldn't convert to a number. So there's something wrong. There's something in this column that's not being able to be converted to a number. So as soon as you see some sort of data format or conversion error, you always suspect this dangerous change type step again. This, this thing, when I promoted the headers, Power Query was trying to help me saying, look, you sit back and relax. I'll go and check all the data types and all your columns and I'll change them for you. And indeed it did, it changed this column. And if you look up here in the code, it changed that column to an integer data type for me. So I'm gonna delete that because that's what's causing the error. And if I click and drop down, load more now, and come down to the bottom, notice this product key here. And so what is happening is that because I'm combining five sheets and every sheet has a header row, then by the time I get to the second sheet, I get a second copy of the header row. The third sheet has a third copy of the header row and so on. And of course, I only need the first copy of the header row. And so I need to manually remove that, the repeating header rows here. Once I remove that, then I can um, go back and change the data type should I want to. I'm not gonna do that um, just at the moment because um, there's a couple of other things that I want, that I want to do first. All right, so um, now notice that I've got my column um, my column headers here now, so this is all good, but I don't want to call this column May, I need to call this um, month, right? So the first column should be, called, should be called month, but here's a problem and I'm going to show, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Here's a problem, what I've just done is I've hard coded a line of code that says go and find the column called May and rename it month. Now, as I mentioned before, at some point in time, presumably there's going to be a new sheet of data that comes along. Now I'm not going to create the new sheet of data, but what I will do is I'll just swap the order of these two sheets. So now April is the first sheet. And so I'm going to close that down. And now I'm going to come back in here and hit refresh preview. And now it throws an error. And the reason it throws an error, once again, you have to go back, is that when I promoted the headers now, it, the header no longer is May, it's now April. And so when I come down here and say rename the columns, it's trying to find a column called May and call it month, but of course there is no column called May. There's only a column called April. And so we need a way of <clears throat> 
giving a relative name or a relative rename to this particular step. And so instead of um, instead of renaming the column called April, I need to rename the first column to month. That's what I need to do. All right, so let's, um, I want to introduce you to a, um, a special function, which you may have heard of, this may be new. So I'm going to create a new query, and this will be a blank query. And there's a special function in Power Query, or in M, called shared. So you go equals hash shared. And this is a special function or a special uh, reserve name. And it's case sensitive. And if you type in shared, you'll get a list of all the documentation of all of the functions that exist inside the M language. And at the moment, this is technically called a table. So this is technically called a list. And I'm going to convert it into a table by clicking this into table. After I convert it to a table, I've got a searchable table or a column with a searchable inside a searchable table that allows me to go looking for functions to solve my problems. Now, I need a function that tells me the first name or the names of the columns. In, and so I'm just going to come in here and on a guess. Now, admittedly, I do know what the, the name of the function is, but I can tell you when I started this process, this is exactly what I did. So I need something to find me the names. So I'm just typing in names or column names and see here that there's a function called table.columnNames. So that's showing a lot of promise. Let me do that again. So let me come into column names. So table.columnNames. Let me have a look at this function. Now I can click here in the gray box and see the details or I can click on the function itself. And when I click on the function, it actually invokes the function and gives me the documentation on how that function works. And so this function, it takes a table as its parameter and it returns the column names. And so my table is, unfortunately, it's not, it's, um, it's a pretty bad name, so I won't invoke it here. So what I've got now is I've got the information I need. Let me change this so I can refer to it later. I'm gonna call this, um, I'll call it sales, I'll call it data, just in case I have a conflict. And so now I'm going to use my new function. So I'm going to uh, create a new step. And um, this step automatically refers to the previous step. So I might just rename this, I'll call this all data, sort of like I did before. So here's my new step, it refers to the previous step. And now I'm going to use my new function, which is table, case sensitive, column names, open brackets, and that's the table. And now I get a list of all of the columns in my table. So that's exactly what I need to know. And if I just extend what we learned before, remember if I click here, I could right click and get this April, but I've already learned the naming convention on how to get the first row. If I want to get the first row, I have to use the curly brace zero. So I could just start writing some M code. And now this line of code tells me the name of the first column, which is exactly what I need to know. And now that I've got this line of code, I'm going to copy this code, control C, and now I'm just going to delete this. I don't need it anymore. And now I'm back, but in my clipboard is the line of code that contains the relative reference to the first column in my data. So now I'm going to use the UI again. So I'm going to double click and I'm going to call this month. And when I do that, it hard codes a column called April and renames it month. But instead of hard coding that, I'm going to use my line of code that is the relative reference pointing to the name of the first column in my table. And so if the first column changes, this will change and the code will still work. And so if I come back to my worksheet now and I'll just open that up and I'll switch my sheets back again. Remember when I did this before, it triggered an error. And when I come back here now and I refresh my preview, 
now you can see I've got May as the first sheet, yet the renaming step still worked as I expected. And so I could have done the drill down step as I did before, but I'm actually using what I learnt in the previous demo and, um, and actually writing that line of code. And that's just simplified this over here. And what I think is another good practice is if you have a step where you've done something a little bit funky here like this, it's pretty easy to forget. So I'm going to right click and go to properties and just make a note to myself. So I changed absolute ref to relative. OK, so I just make a note to myself. And very recently, Microsoft has updated Power Query, so you now get this little icon telling you that there's a note that's been written against that step. And if you hover over that icon, it'll actually give you the note without having to go to the properties. This is such a big improvement, um, so much more encouraging for you to document your code and to, um, and to go from there. All right, so I think that's pretty much it with that um, second um, query. I'm just a little bit conscious of time because I want to leave um, some question, uh, some time for questions. I think what I'll do is I'll get, um, just let me do my wrap slide and then I'll get started with the calendar table, but I won't do a full demo on the calendar table. I want to leave about five to 10 minutes for questions. So I'll, I'll aim to finish up in, in sort of eight minutes on the demo. So the new learnings here are that there's a, new, a function called table.columnNames. It's a great one to remember. If you don't remember, you can use the hash shared name or even the IntelliSense now is pretty good. Um, you can use this zero as the first row as you've previously learned, and then you can actually go in and edit the code yourself so that you're continuously improving um, things. All right, so I just want to get cracking on this last one so that um, I can get at least some of this done before we uh, break for questions. That looks like it's the wrong one. So here's the third blank. So this is another blank workbook. OK, so this time I'm going to do a new query blank query. And the whole idea here was to show you that you could create a calendar table from scratch without loading any data. So Power Query doesn't have to connect to a source. You can generate your own data. And so the first thing I'm going to show you is that I could come up here into the formula bar and I'm going to use the curly braces, which are the list operator, and I can create a list of values. So one comma two comma three. If I type in that, I get a list of numbers one, two, three. In fact, a list does not have to be all of the same data type. So I can put text, I can put Boolean. And uh, and it's case sensitive. So true, false is lowercase, not uppercase. And so I've just basically generated a list. So as you can see, I can generate my own data. Now with this list, it would be possible for me to, uh, I can also do this, so one double dot 10, give me a list of numbers from one to 10. And in fact, it, I could go give me numbers from magic number 43831 and 44,000. And if you've used Excel, these might look familiar. I'm going to turn that into a table. And once it's a table, I'm going to click on the column and change the data type to a date. And now basically I've got a column of value starting from the 1st of January 2020. Now, this is actually, that's a little bit of a hack. Um, that's not the way I would want to do it. I just wanted to show you that I could do that. Um, instead, um, what I want to do is find a function that will generate a list of dates for me. Now, I could use the hash shared function again to go and find a list of dates, but I do want to save a bit of time. And so I'm just going to use the IntelliSense. And there's a function called list.dates. So um, you can use your intuition. If you've done any other programming or Excel functions, intuition goes a long way. Just have a stab at it, see if you can guess what the function is. Now, when you type a function like this, if you don't know how the function works, all you have to do is just hit enter and don't put any parameters. Don't put any parentheses around the edge. And what that will do is it'll give you the syntax. And so this is telling me how it's used, but even better, it's giving me a wizard 
that will allow me to execute the function. And so I'm going to come up here. I want to start on the 1st of January 2020. How many days do I want to progress? I'm just going to pick 10. And what is the step? So I want to step by one full day. I'll click invoke. And here's my list of dates. And the good thing is that I'm able to come up here and actually see the syntax of what's going on. So without even having to understand that to advance by a day, I had to use the hash duration. And this is the way I enter the date. I was able to just go ahead and, and generate that step. Now notice that the, that the start of this function is actually called query one, which is this function step here. And so this is a little bit confusing, but what I can do, just I'll, I'll show you this. And, and I learned by trial and error, I'm going to copy everything in the brackets, control C. I'm going to come back here and I'm just going to paste that in there. And so basically instead of having two steps to do that invocation, I'm just got a single step. So I'm, I'm basically just tidying it up a little bit there. So look, I realize I'm doing a couple of things here that you may not know, but awareness is pretty powerful. So here's my list of dates. I'm going to turn that into a table. And once I've got a table, um, I am going to change it to a date and I'm going to rename the column. And so I'm on my way to generating my calendar table. Now, in order to make this a little bit more flexible, what I'd like to do is I'd like the user to be able to specify the start date and the number of days that it should advance. And so I'll just show you how I'm going to do this. So I'm going to create a new step and this step is going to be called start date. And instead of referring to the previous step, I'm just going to type in 1 1 2020, which is a date. Notice there's no equal sign. If I go equals 1 1 2020, it'll give me 1 divided by 1 divided by 2020. But if I don't put the equal sign, it, it's quite happy. It treats that as if it's a date. So there's my start date. Um, now, I want to get my end date as well, so I'm going to do another step. I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this my end date. And there's a couple of ways you can do an end date. Um, I could put in uh, today's date, so 28th of the 7th. But I really, the good practice is that you should have your calendar tables going forward in time through to the end of the current year. And so that implies that I need to know what is today's date. And so once again, I encourage you to channel your experience from Excel and guess what is the function to tell me what today's date is. So I'm going to guess it's today and I bombed out. There is no function called today. So have a guess. What's your next best guess? I know you can't tell me. Next best guess, the one I used was now. So when I type in now, I can see there's a stack of functions and I just picked one date time local now. That looks like a good candidate. So I'm going to hit tab, hit enter. Um, it doesn't take any parameters. So all I have to do is put open and close brackets and there it is. That's the, that's the date and time now. Now I'm just going to pick it up because I, I, I need to get this finished. Um, I can't use this because this is a date and time. So I need to be able to extract just the date. So same process, I need to find a function. And I happen to know there's one just from experience, from using the shared, from using the IntelliSense. There's a function that extracts the date. And so that is now the date. And then if I want to find the end of year, same again. I need something end of year, end of, so I can type in. Notice the IntelliSense is not very good here, but you can fix it just by wrapping this in brackets first and then going back and trying year. So I need date, there it is, date, end of year. Now I've got the end of year of the current year. And so this will automatically refresh over and over again. So now I've got the start date, I've got the end date. If I subtract those two, so I'm going to go a new step, it's the end date, subtract the start date. This should tell me how many days I've got, and it does. There's 365 days, so I need my calendar, sorry. 
use it, right? I need my calendar to run for 365 days. In actual fact, it's probably plus one. But notice that this is not an integer. This is days, hours, minutes, seconds. And so somehow I have to extract the days. And once again, just to save a bit of time, um, if I type in days, open bracket, let me do the open bracket trick first. You can type in days. Uh, there's one here, so you just got to you just got to go hunting for the functions and find one that looks promising. So both of these look promising, but I'm going to take duration days, and that extracts the integer number of days. I think I need to have plus one in here to get it to go through the end of the year. Oh, it didn't like that. So there you go. You learn from writing this code, right? So. I have to first of all get the duration and then add one to take it 366 this year. So that's correct. All right, so I'm going to rename this and I'm going to call it um, length. And then the last thing I'm going to do before I, I stop this process is I can go all the way back to my source step and now I can replace this hard coded date with the start date. Note that they're in they're not in logical order. The start date appears after the source, but it doesn't matter inside DAX. And this, oh, sorry, this is M. And then this is the length. OK, so I've just hard coded those two and now I've got my calendar. And the last thing I need to do is bring my calendar back. And so I can do that by going adding a new step. And instead of taking the previous step, I want to go back and grab the renamed columns step. And then I have it. I've got my calendar table. It detects today's date. It works out. It pushes the calendar through to the end of the year. My end user is able to specify the start date for any calendar they want. And now I can go ahead and do things like add column, um, date, month, name of month, and then I can add another column, date, year, um, the year, and so on. I would build out the additional columns and then the last thing I would do, typically what I do is I come up here to the advanced editor. Not sure why I can't get to the advanced editor there. It's interesting. Hmm. Advanced editor is grayed out. Oh, there we go. So if I come to the advanced editor, I can actually copy this code and I have I have code like this that I keep in Microsoft OneNote and every time I need a new calendar, I cut and paste it into a blank query and then I go and change the start date and that's it. I'm off and running without having to do any more work. So look, that took a little bit longer than I'd hoped. I ran a few minutes over, but I want to um, just let me wrap up with that slide. I do have a blog article on that if you want to go and have a look at that in some more depth. Um, but so yeah, hopefully you found those um, three demos of use. If you want to learn more about Power Query, I have some training that you can investigate here. There's a special discount code there if you're interested. And I'd be happy to take um, questions from anyone on anything. And I don't have a hard stop here, so I don't know whether um, whether you do hello or not. But um. Well, we do have some questions. Thank you mm -hmm. for this special discounts, by the way. Uh, re yeah. Regarding demo one, when I use import from folder, uh, sometimes I get an error message if the yeah. first file is no longer available in the folder. Is there any way to make the first file name generic to avoid this? That's a good question. The answer is yes. And in fact, that is the default behavior. So, um, so if I come back to, um, so if I get data more from folder, the key is not to touch the UI. So when you go get file from folder, you're given this wizard. So the first thing that appears is this wizard. Um, I don't know if I've got my path here anymore. Just quickly. This is so much quicker than trying to navigate. And so once I do this, this window, oh, uh, combine and transform, more steps than I remembered. This one here, as long as you don't touch this and it says first file, then it should be fine. Um, as soon as you touch this and you say, I want the file called file one, then you've locked yourself in. I've basically hard coded 
the query to say look for file one and if it can't find file one then it could cause an issue it's a little bit more complicated than that but that's that's my best advice is never touch this always leave it on the first file and that should solve the problem now it, it can there can be other causes for the problem as well um, particularly if there's some hard coding inside your code but i showed you the technique where you could specify relative um, rows and file names as well so the answer is in there somewhere but it's a little bit longer answer than we really have time for okay uh, next question is about importing xlsb files yeah yes yeah. so i can i've actually <laughs> is there any workaround so other than converting them <laughs> to xlsx um, i haven't done this for some time so i will take it as red pg has tested this um i mean i I know that there are some files that don't work. I know that X, my understanding was that XLSB would work as long as you had the access um, jet or the, the data provider. So let's just do a quick test. Um, there it is. So my understanding is that they can be done as long, oh, this is, What happened there, do you reckon? Did it just, uh, let's just try again. Did, did uh, there it is, file, file, save a copy. Maybe I saved it somewhere where I wasn't expecting. File four extracts value from cells. That looks right, doesn't it? it? Says it's there, I just didn't see it. All right, so about to do a quick demo. So um, I can't really give you a, uh, there, there we go. So let's go from Excel. Don't know how it got up into OneDrive already. Yeah, so that's working. Um, my recollection of the issue is that you need the access data provider access is an OLE, OL uh, access data provider. Um, I know I've got a blog article about this, um, but yeah, so there's a, there's an, there's an additional piece of software. This one here, ACE OLEB 12.0. If you install that, I think you'll find that the problem goes away. It actually uses that, um, that data provider to import data from um, XLSB. That's my understanding. So be interested to hear if if that works or not. Okay, um, so okay ne tip. next question. Any tips and tricks to import multiple workbooks with multiple sheet data to single workbook from SharePoint? Wow, yep. Yes, I do. I'll just, I'll give you a quick tip. If you go to my blog, um, so there, there's a number of manual steps, um, multiple sheets, multiple workbooks. So I have written a blog article. And um, one of the reasons this one here, combine multiple sheets from multiple workbooks. One of the reasons I write these um, blog articles, I, I like sharing what I know, but some of these things are so tricky to remember that if I document it, then I've got it when I need it next time. And so this is one of those tricky steps where you've got multiple sheets in multiple workbox. The only thing it doesn't cover is um, SharePoint being the source, but the principle is the same. And in fact, this whole process works on the manual combined processes, not using the other combined wizards. So I would suggest you have a read at that and, and hopefully that will solve that for you. Christian, my friend Christian's on the call. Hi, Christian. How much is the delay between Power Query new features and Power BI in Power Query in Excel? Um, I think it's about six months from what I've seen. Um, Power Query updates in um, Excel are much more uh, up to date than is Power Pivot for Excel. So the Power Query team is still in pretty good development phase. And so um, Power Query for Excel does lag about six months is my understanding. And then there's data flows um, in the cloud as well, and that's a little bit later again. But Power Query in Excel is pretty good, actually. So, so not too much that's missing. And Christian again. So I've I've met Christian many times. So, uh, you, um, so good to talk to Christian again. What do you recommend in terms of calendar build it in Power Query, DAX, data flows, or SQL import? That's another great question. Um, there's no one right answer. It's whatever works for you. 
my personal preference is Power Query. The reason I like Power Query for calendar tables is that all of my data is managed in Power Query. Um, if I wasn't going to use Power Query, the, the, the least valuable option, in my view, is there's a, there's a table function called Calendar Auto. I would never recommend using that. So don't come in here. Well, there might be some people, you ask my opinion, so I'll, um, so I don't even know what that is. Calendar Auto. Um, so that will generate the start of a calendar table for you. And then, um, then you have to go in and add the additional columns that you want. The trouble with doing it this way is that you have to manually add those columns, the year column, the month column, blah, blah, blah. And then when you start a new workbook, you've got to do it again because there's no easy way of cut, cutting and pasting all the calculated columns. And so that's my least favorite. Um, SQL BI has got a very good date table, which is 1,500 rows of DAX code. But um, to me, it's a bit too complex and I've always been able to successfully use my Power Query one. So, so that's my preferred approach. Um, okay, so another question. Um, are we okay? We're just a few minutes over. Is that okay? Hello? Yes, that, that, that's okay. fine. Okay, also want I to know how to fill API header key. Oh, good question. I, I'm not well placed to give an answer about an API header key parameter in Power Query. Um, I've never really used APIs. Um, I'm trying to think who's the expert in API keys. Probably Chris Webb or uh, Miguel Escobar. So um, I would try one of those guys for their blog, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about um, APIs, so I can't really answer that. Um, okay, so Christian's question was actually for everyone else what they normally do. Okay, so I think that's, I think that's it, unless there's any other questions or comments. Uh, we don't have further questions as far as I can see. Um, Matt, thanks a lot. It was very valuable and informative sessions. Great. Uh, well, thank you for having thanks me. Thanks for that. And, and, and again, thank you for this special discount for uh, our audience. You're welcome. And, um, and hopefully I'll see people when I get to uh, Istanbul one day. Yeah, be our guest next time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank, thank I, well, you if I, for your, uh, this great session. It was really thanks, informative and useful. And uh, as Halil stayed, whenever you came to Istanbul, just ping us. If I come, Hope I will you. definitely come and speak at the user group when we're post-COVID. And, and my passing comment for everyone would be just have a go at the UI and the M language. Um, there is, unfortunately, there's no undo, so don't do it on your production workbooks unless you have a backup, but just have a go. You'd be surprised what you can learn by having a go, so that's my advice. Okay, uh, I think there is one more question, maybe. Uh, that's yeah. okay. Uh, I think we are done. Uh, th thanks a lot. We don't have further questions. Thank you for joining us today again. See you next time in Istanbul. Okay. Thank, thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day.